Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, a real pleasure to be back here at ICT, especially as uh, tail end Charlie before lunch. I think that's a, a sign of respect from Boaz that uh, I've got to keep you guys awake before we get our next injection of caffeine and food. Um, before I begin, um, I will start by echoing what my colleagues have said before me. I think I'm correct in saying that with Boaz, we are both what the US Navy calls plank holders in PTSS. We were there at the creation. I had the honor of working for Colonel Nick Pratt for four years, and I can say hand on heart, I have never in my life worked for somebody like Nick Pratt. He truly was a warrior scholar, and one of the few people that re uh, reinstates your faith in humankind. He is sorely missed, and I'd like to say thank you to Boaz and Jonathan for last night's commemoration. Before I begin, uh, I'm going to give you a caveat or a word of warning. When I do this lecture on the enemy threat doctrine of jihad for the FBI, for our Green Berets at Fort Bragg, they give me eight hours. I now have 16 minutes, and that's without questions and answers. So uh, forgive me, this will be the wave tops, or as we say in America, the cliff notes of the cliff notes of the cliff notes. <laughs> Who misses the Cold War? Hands up. Come on. Well, wasn't it great? I mean, I grew up in the Cold War. My parents escaped uh, communist Hungary in a revolution in 1956. I was formed by the Cold War, and I miss it immensely because it was easy. The enemy had a street address. When Khrushchev gave a six-hour speech to the Politburo, we had it translated in less than 24 hours by somebody at Langley. The current threat environment is very, very different. The enemy is not a nation state, but like our last foe, like the Soviet Union, it was driven by an ideology. And this is what I want to talk to you today about. I'd like to echo what Dr. Evans said this morning. In the intelligence community of this nation, of America, of elsewhere, we tend to focus too much on individuals and organizations. We shouldn't. It's about an ideology. The kind of ideology that can turn an 18-year-old into a suicide bomber. And that's what we have to understand. And today what I'd like to do is to link the threat groups, whether they are Hamas, whether they are Al-Qaeda, to the current threat du jour, which is the Islamic State or ISIS, and to demonstrate why it is so resilient and what we're getting wrong and what we should really pay attention to. So you've all seen this. Um, I'd like to tell you that my other job, apart from the things I do for the Marine Corps and for the Special Forces and others, is I'm also the national security editor for a political website in uh, the US called Breitbart.com. As a result of that, I have a whole team of individuals working for me whose job it is solely to monitor the social media of ISIS, of the Islamic State, to look at their Twitter feeds, look at what they're doing, and to put it up in the un unclassified open source domain. And I'm going to use the work of my colleagues to illustrate the threat we are facing today. This is the individual that heads what is now called the Islamic State, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who on the first Friday of Ramadan gave a speech in the biggest mosque in Mosul. Let me illustrate by way of his speech how misunderstood that event was. In the IC, in the intelligence community in the United States and elsewhere, we focused almost feverishly on the technical aspects of this speech. How ISIS managed to move its leader into that city, which had been under US control not long ago, and managed to close down all internet traffic and mobile cell phone towers for the duration of his speech to make it difficult to do any operations against him. That's what was so sexy for the analysts in the intelligence community. When they missed the complete point of the speech, 
Just look at the photograph. What is this individual telling to his audience? How is he dressed? Bin Laden, Zawahiri, always used to wear a uh, US issue M65 camouflage jacket. Remember? Yeah, when they give their speeches. This man has no camouflage jacket. In fact, what is he wearing? Clerical robes and a turban redolent of Mohammed. And look at his nom de guerre. Because Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is not his real name, but what name has he chosen for himself? The name of the first caliph after Mohammed, Abu Bakr. And if you watch the video, and I encourage you to do so, it is fascinating. Before he gives his sermon, he takes out a miswak, a small twig. And what does he do with it? Cleans his teeth. Not with a Hello Kitty toothbrush, but with a twig. Why? Because Islam tells of Muhammad's scrupulous cleanliness and how he would use a twig to clean his teeth. He is sending a message. He is not giving a strategic military lecture. He is giving a sermon. And what did he do in that sermon? Declare the reestablishment of the caliphate. This is what is important, not the fact that ISIS managed to close down the cell phone towers. He sees himself as undoing the unjust decision of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk to dissolve the caliphate in 1924. That's the significance of the Mosul lecture. Also, we should look at names accurately. There's a big debate in America right now. Is it ISIS? Is it ISIL? Is it IS? Even before it became the Islamic State, it should have been called ISIS, not to denote Syria, but to denote Al-Sham. Why? Because Al-Sham has resonance with the people who are listening. It should not be translated as the Levant. It is bigger than the Levant. And also, in the last 60 years, Al-Sham has been established or been given eschatological content for jihadi audiences. What do I mean by that? El Sham is the location in which the final jihad will happen. This isn't just another jihad. This isn't Afghanistan in the 1980s. This isn't Kashmir. They are using terminology based upon the concept that this is the final holy war. If you fight in this one, you're better than any other jihadi because this will be the beginning of end times of the judgment day. Words matter. Narrative is very important. The next slide, I have to admit, I stole from my wife. My wife, Katie Gorka, runs something called the Council on Global Security in Virginia. And she has a program, you can buy this, you can get this for free, where you can take the text of a speech, press a button, and it turns the speech into a slide based upon the frequency individual words were used. The more times a word was said, the bigger it gets. This is a textual representation based upon frequency of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's speech from Mosul. Now look at that for a second. Can anybody out there locate for me the word Syria or Iraq? It's not there. Why? Because this isn't about Syria and Iraq. This is about what? God's sovereignty and the Ummah and the Caliphate. The idea that this is some regional problem, that this is something to do with just Maliki and Assad, completely misinterprets the nature of the threat group and their narrative. This isn't about geography, it's about religious war. And what happened the day after the speech? We took this, my, my team took this off the Twitter feed of the Islamic State the day after the Mosul speech. 
just in case you didn't get the message, they're telling you that this isn't just about Syria and Iraq. This is the new caliphate, as described by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Bigger than the caliphate ever was. Most of Africa, the Indian subcontinent, not just the bottom of Spain, all of Spain. This is the reality of the threat. Let's look at something that was mentioned several times already, foreign fighters. This is just unclassified open source with regards to foreign fighters just in Syria from a British website, a uh, uh, think tank. Look at the numbers. Al-Qaeda never managed to do this. It wanted to, but never managed to do this. And it's also recruiting Americans. Look at these clean-looking young men. They could be Marines. Well, they're not Marines. They are jihadists working for the new caliph, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And just in case you didn't get it still, here's their Twitter feed telling us it's not about Assad, it's not about Maliki, it's about what? Our civilization. It's not about something a few hundred miles away or a few thousand miles away. It literally, literally is existential, us or them. So, what does this all mean? What is ISIS there for? What is the Islamic State? Number one, the richest terrorist group in history. Now, you've got to be careful with the open source reporting, but the fact is we know they have at least, at least $800 million in cash from the Iraqi government. Think about one metric. The 9-11 Commission report stated that 9-11 cost bin Laden $500,000. You can't buy a house on my street in McLean, Virginia for $500,000. And they killed 3,000 people with $500,000. IS can now do 1,600 9-11s if they should want to just from their raids on the Iraqi National Bank. It is now an insurgency. What's the difference between a terrorist group and insurgency? The first difference is an insurgency holds territory. These guys, as you heard today, hold territory, equivalent to the size of Maryland. Third, it is recruiting Westerners in numbers that are unheard of previously for a jihadist organization. It has captured military hardware, and it is about to capture a state. Last thing I'd like to do is to talk about why ISIS is so much more dangerous when it comes to the propaganda domain, or if you want to be politically correct, strategic communications. Al-Qaeda really had two types of propaganda, two categories. One was the, the nasty stuff, the stuff that makes you want to vomit. Yeah? KSM, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, cutting off Daniel Pearl's head on television, yeah? Number one. Second category was internal consumption, such as Inspire magazine, when you're recruiting people into the movement and you're giving them tradecraft. Remember, the Boston bombers did what? Built a pressure cooker bomb, which is taken from issue one of Inspire magazine. Yeah? It's in there. Literally, the article is called how to build, build a bomb in your mom's kitchen, yeah? So the shocking stuff and the internal stuff. ISIS has everything plus. It has the shocking stuff. You've all seen it. Uh, Sotlov, you've seen the Foley execution. You've seen Shiites being rounded up and killed. But it also has this, U.S. Humvees flying the black flag of jihad. It also has... This. Now, please don't just take my word for it. Google it. This is from ISIS's Twitter feed, a new one, and it's about jihad and kittens. They so understand our audience 
that they want to say, hey, it's not all about cutting people's heads off. Look, we're human beings too. Oh, look at the soft side of the jihad. Yeah? Al-Qaeda never did this. They never understood our culture as well as these individuals do. This is perhaps the most disturbing of all. 300 Kurdish t children taken hostage, and allegedly this is one of the children who's been brainwashed to kill Kurds. Yeah? Al-Qaeda never managed to do this. Shocking. And I put this slide in because of what I've heard this morning about genocide. Yes, the Yazidis. But what about this? Who's seen this photograph? No? This is from Mosul, last month. What is that letter in Arabic? N, the letter N, for followers of the Nazarene. On Friday, the Christians were given 24 hours to leave Mosul, and every house with a Christian family in it was painted with the letter N. Does that ring any bells? Houses being marked, yeah? This is another genocide. So what? The most important question of all, to conclude. ISIS is the new Al-Qaeda, but it is worse than Al-Qaeda on several metrics. It is about to capture a state. It understands social media. It is a recruiting, uh, its recruiting pool globally is enormous and its ideology is all about infidels. Not just Alawites from Assad's regime or Maliki and Shias, it is about us as well, Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians and everybody else. So please read, if you haven't, the ideology that feeds this threat group, especially Qutb, uh, Azam, and Brigadier S.K. Malik. Last thing I'll do is to explain to you why America in the last four years has had such a catastrophic response to the events in the Middle East. This is some inside baseball, but it's all unclassified. I can talk about names later, but from the podium I won't. Four years ago, an academic who was brought into the National Counterterrorism Council was lifted into the National Security Council, the White House, and he sold the cabinet on the following analysis. Just bear with me. He said that in the world, there are three types of Islamists, purists, political Islamists, and violent Islamists. An Islamist, Islamist being a person who sees the caliphate as the only way to live. You must recreate the caliphate. He convinced the president that there are three versions of those who believe in the caliphate. Those who wish to create the caliphate only through dawah, the purists, through preaching, through proselytizing. Then there are the political Islamists who say preaching isn't enough. You must reach out. You must win elections. This is, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas. And then these are the ones we care about in Washington, Al-Qaeda and associated movements, the, the tiny group of people that are actually saying politics isn't enough, dawah isn't enough, pick up a knife, cut off an infidel's head. The analyst said these are three separate communities. And he said... The only way to save America from another 9-11, from the violent jihadists, is to negotiate with and recognize the political jihadists. The only way to save America is to legitimize the Ikhwan Muslimin. And that is why you see what you saw in Egypt. Now, what, of, what is, of course, the problem with this analysis? Number one, it's a total load of rubbish. In reality, these are not three hermetically sealed Tupperware boxes. They are what? Completely overlapping communities. If you look at the unclassified biographical data of any jihadist leader, I mean anyone, and I'm not exaggerating, bin Laden, Zawahiri, uh, uh, um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, Anwar al-Alaki, what do you see in their lives? They all start here as regular believers. They all become members of the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood is too weak for them, so they go to Jihad. As my friend Tom Jocelyn has testified on the Hill in Congress, you must understand the Brotherhood, Hamas included, is the gateway drug to Jihad. It is the entry point, and he's absolutely correct. Last thing, and I promise this is my, my, my last visual slide, and then I'll give you some contact details. This is the dirty little secret nobody in Washington wants to tell you. 
for the last 13 years. We are obsessed as a national security architecture in these guys, yeah? As we say in Bragg, that's the 25 meter target, yeah? I want to neutralize Al Qaeda groups, Al Shabaab, Al Nusra, yeah? But these guys down here, the Ikhwan, Hamas, outnumber the kinetic jihadists by literally factors of thousands. And whilst they may argue amongst themselves, they do have arguments in the magazine Inspire. The arguments are always what? Tactical arguments. How to create the caliphate, when to create the caliphate. Why? Because both threat groups have what strategic objective? The same strategic objective, to create undemocratic theocracies. That is why it's not about ISIS or Al-Qaeda. It's about ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, the Brotherhood, you name it. OK, uh, bottom line, my message. The center of gravity for this war is not an organization or an individual. It's the ideology. We must attack the ideology, and America hasn't even begun to do so in the last 13 years because it's religion. Can't touch that. I recommend a book by my wife. Uh, called Fighting the Ideological War, Winning Strategies from Communism to Islamism, and also her website, uh, the Council on Global uh, Security, which monitors and fights back on the Ikhwan and the jihadists. And then lastly, um, if you'd like to continue offline, you can ask me who that person was in the National Security Council that got us into such trouble. All right, thank you very much, and sorry for being slightly over time.